Good morning to everyone, and welcome to this Sunday morning service of Emmanuel Fellowship Church. So glad that you could join us. I'm going to read now from Psalm 100, and Psalm 100 calls you and me to praise the Lord, to worship him with joy and gladness. And what I find intriguing about passages like this is that the psalmist doesn't ask about our circumstances. Um, th there's no contingency clause on this call to worship and praise God. He doesn't say, you know, if things are going well for you, praise the Lord. If you've had a good week, if you're at, at the top of a, of a crest, um, then, then worship the Lord. He just calls us as God's people, really all people, ought to praise the Lord. So whatever your circumstances, um, God invites you now to um, trust him with whatever hardships you're enduring and thank him for whatever joys you're experiencing and offer to him the thanks and praise of which he is so worthy. And let's prepare to do that even as we hear these words now from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. I would invite you now to join me in praying this corporate prayer of invocation. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, our desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the gracious power of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together now singing number 567 from the Trinity Psalter hymnal, The Doxology. This morning, we consider God's will from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, uh, which contains a call to unity, to live in the unity that we have as Christians. And this is so important, I think, for us right now. It isn't hard right now to find a broad spectrum of convictions on a host of pressing issues. Um, you know the issues that I'm talking about. And right now, there is the distinct possibility of infighting in the, in the church, of mistrust, of um, cynicism toward brothers and sisters, of sort of pulling away because of positions that others hold um, in a tense time. So a lot of, lot of uh, d d divisive issues facing us right now. Um, thankfully, God's call to peace and love doesn't require us to fully agree with one another on various questions uh, relating to the implementation of stay-at-home orders or when or how to return to congregational worship or whether the government has our best interests in mind. We, we might have shades of differences or vast differences from others who are close to us, even in the church, on those kinds of issues. We're hopefully doing the best that we can with regard to those things, but we don't see them the same, do we? What does Ephesians 4 call us to do? Well, it, it calls us to affirm what we have in common. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Those are things we have in common and we're sure of. 
And, and by focusing on our unity that God is creating for us, we can bear with each other through the disagreements that we have with humility and gentleness and patience. Listen now as we hear from Ephesians 4, 1 through 7 on God's call to express the unity that we have in Christ um, while uh, holding various positions on important topics. Paul says this, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So God's will for us is to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called to bear with one another, to be patient and gentle toward each other, and to practice unity in the bond, uh, in, in, in uh, unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So that's a good will that God has for us. And um, we, we want to do that. We ought to want to do that. We know we've come short. And so we now have the opportunity to seek God's mercy, not only in our lack of uh, of understanding and unity and patience and all of those, but for, for just in general falling short of God's will. So would you join me in praying aloud uh, the bold words of the prayer that will come on your screen in just a moment, seeking God's mercy, uh, which he promises to sinners. And um, this is a good prayer for children, especially who can't read, because children, when when, you're, when the adults in the room are, are, are speaking aloud in this prayer, they're going to be saying the same thing time after time. Simply, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. And so, as you hear the adults in the room um, asking for mercy, you too can join in and say, have mercy on us. Let's pray together. Lord, King and Father unbegotten, true essence of the Godhead, have mercy on us. Lord, fount of light and creator of all things, have mercy on us. Lord, you who have signed us with the seal of your image, have mercy on us. Christ, true God and true man, have mercy on us. Christ, rising sun through whom are all things, have mercy on us. Christ, perfection of wisdom, have mercy on us. Lord, life-giving spirit and power of life, have mercy on us. Lord, breath of the Father and the Son, in whom are all things, have mercy on us. Lord, forgiver of sin and giver of grace, abandon us not because of our sins, Consoler of the sorrowing soul, have mercy on us. Amen. Listen now, friend, if you have uh, truly confessed your sins and sought mercy in the Lord alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have become your, your rock, your, your life, your hope, though you recognize your need for mercy and your failings. Hear this a presentation of the gospel from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, and let it be a, co a consolation to you as you confess your sins. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works." so that no man may boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we pray for mercy. We need mercy. We cry out for it. And we're promised in Scripture that God is rich in mercy and has lavished it upon us in Jesus Christ. Let this be our our comfort and our hope as we now worship the Lord with, with assured consciences and hopeful spirits. We're going to sing together now number 415, We Gather Together. That may seem strange to say, well, we're all apart. We're not really gathered together, but we really are. We really are gathered together. The, um, uh, near the closing of the book of Hebrews, the writer says, um, we, we have come together to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem. We've come together to the Lord. And so let's sing together this message of, of unity and the church. We gather together, 415. Join me now in a moment of prayer, joining your voice with mine at the end with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship and praise your holy name with joy and thanksgiving, as you have called us to do in Psalm 100. We thank you that you invite praise from your people, even from all the earth. And so, Thank you for drawing us into this holy company that you have called the saints, the the church of Jesus Christ, your beloved people. And we thank you for the mercy that you have lavished upon us in Jesus and through the uh, applying work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for forgiving our sins and giving us this new and living way into the Holy of Holies, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that the body of Christ was was torn and broken in two so that um, we might, who have wandered away from you, be brought close and um, resume the fellowship with you that we so desperately need. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his um, sinless perfection, and his true humanity. We thank you that he is like us in all ways except sin and is able to to sympathize with us and to bring us with him into the fruit of the new covenant of grace. We pray, Lord, that you would um, help us in this week, beginning just now, to focus on what is most true. Um, We're all watching the news or reading reports, and uh, we we hear so many things, so many facts and opinions and theories, and we pray that we would sift through uh, this news with discernment and do help us to uh, do the best we can with what we're hearing, but help us to be most sure 
not about this theory or that theory um, with regard to our current situation, but to be most sure um, about who you are, how you have revealed yourself to us, um, the eternal life that you have given to us, the importance of the church of Jesus Christ and the need for the church to be a witness in the world. Help us to be certain of our calling to holiness and love and good deeds to which we have been appointed as your word has taught us. Help us to be most certain, um, not about the um, benevolence or lack of benevolence of this or that politician, but about the benevolence of God and about our eternal life and the inheritance that you have prepared for us in heaven. So help us to be good citizens in this country and good neighbors in this world, but help us to be most focused on um, the high calling that you've given to us to live as Christians in light of the good news. Father, we thank you so much for the health that we enjoy, though um, we recognize many people's health has been compromised, and we pray that you would um, preserve them body and soul, either uh, in this life or through the transition in the life to come in your care. We thank you for the families that we have, the friends, the loved ones who support us. We thank you for the Church of Christ and for the unity that we have, as we have heard in your word in Ephesians chapter 4. We thank you for um, the signs of the covenant that unify us, uh, the baptism, the, the breaking of bread. We thank you for uh, the singleness of the God that we worship, that there is one God that unites us all by faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that we would express this unity in practical ways through charity, through um, listening, through uh, attempts to be under, understanding and to uh, embrace those who have uh, processed data differently than we have. We pray that you would help us to care ourselves for the lonely and those that we're not able to reach. We pray that you would reach directly by your Spirit. We pray for those who um, are, are, have become more subject to domestic abuse due to uh, the situation that we find ourselves in and find our, find, people who find themselves in, in dangerous homes. We pray for those who are subject to the horrific sin of human trafficking for the purposes of labor or sex. We pray that you would free these slaves and bring to justice those who are um, uh, using them for their own gain. Lord, we ask that you would also uh, comfort those who are uh, subject to all crimes and have been hurt by sinners like ourselves. Uh, we pray that you would uh, teach us to be penitent of our own sins and the sins of our country. We pray that you would help those who live in fear of racism or uh, other acts of injustice. Uh, we pray that you would remove this scourge from our land as well, as, as well as all of the sins that are so contrary to the kingdom of God. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you today as one people being renewed by the Spirit. And so we ask that you would hear our prayers and that we would um, not only live as disciples, but pray as disciples. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us a, a prayer for disciples. And we pray that together uh, with heart and voice now saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We open our service with a reading of Psalm 100. Let's now sing Psalm 100, selection A, Shout to the Lord All Earth, 100A, uh, from the Trinity Psalter Hymnal.
As we prepare to hear God's word, uh, would you pray with me this prayer for illumination, uh, seeking the Lord's help uh, in overcoming our deficiencies that we would uh, uh, recognize his glory and live lives in, um, uh, in proper response to that. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, our Heavenly Father, we admit that we are sinners, conceived and born in sin, unable of ourselves to do any good. But we do repent of our sins and seek your grace to help us in our remaining weaknesses. Through the teaching of your word, which we confess with the church throughout the ages, satisfy our hunger and quench our thirst with your refreshing truth, that we with all our hearts may love and serve you with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the one and only true God who lives and reigns forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. So we're concluding our study of 1 John, and we're doing it on a note of confidence um, and certainty. Listen for these themes, especially the phrase, we know, in these last verses of 1 John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Sometimes faith is viewed as a sort of hopeful wish. Imagine a, a person who, who confidently bets his financial future on a lottery ticket. Now, of course, you technically have no way of knowing whether your ticket will win or lose. Statistically, it will lose. But evidently, people can convince themselves that maybe this is the one. And, and they have sort of this, this feeling or this hunch or certainly a strong wish or a dream of what it would look like to, to win the lottery. Is, is that what the Christian faith is like? Is faith, to put it differently, contrary to knowing? Is faith more like a wish and contrary to certainty or knowing? Well, that's not at all what the Apostle John says in the end of this first letter. Seven times in the last nine verses, the author explains what we know, using that phrase, or what we may know, as he does in verse 13. In fact, his stated purpose in verse 13 uh, in writing the letter is to confirm to believers that they have eternal life and everything that eternal life includes. So, no, God doesn't want us going through life guessing about who we are or who he is or what he has provided for us. He actually wants us to know. Um, that's not presumptuous to know. It's actually presumptuous to doubt what God says when he wants us to know something. So what is it that we know as believers? And four answers to that 
question rise from the last verses of 1 John. The first is this, we know we have eternal life, verse 13. We know we have eternal life. And this is critical uh, knowledge in a world of death, right? You know, people were not made to die. We, we weren't created to die. We weren't we didn't have built in with us a sort of obs, you know, uh, obsolescence. Death is the penalty for sin, and we earn it fairly. We, we sin knowingly and willingly, and we incur the penalty of death. And yet it is a terrible penalty, right? It cuts short our work. It divides body and soul. And for those outside of Christ, it forever separates them from God's kindness, so what an awful thing to not be clear about. I mean, what if we had to go through life just wondering if we had eternal life or if when we died, we would be forever separated from God and endure a sort of continual dying. But John says that we can be clear about it. Christ has come to share his life with us. God himself, we read in verse 20, is eternal life. God gives us eternal life by sharing the life of his son with us, by giving his son to us, as he says in verse 11. So eternal life in the, in the biblical sense is not at all the same as the common notion that believing in Jesus simply um, spares you from hell. That's not eternal life in, in the biblical sense. Eternal life is a new, unending life in true friendship with God. Whoever, verse 12 says, whoever has the Son has life. So the two come together. God and new life come together in us. So you can see why this is just so vital to know, living in a world of death. Knowing that we have eternal life and that it actually begins now because we now have a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. He's sharing his life with us now. That knowledge frees us from anxiety about our life and about our death and about what lies on the other side of death for us. By faith, our life is linked with the life of the eternal God. That's what faith does. And so... John says we can know we have eternal life. Number two, we know that God answers our prayers, verses 14 through 17. And John says we know that he'll answer our prayers when we ask according to his will. We'll, we'll have what we ask. That's, that's wonderful confidence. Praying isn't useless. It isn't um, it isn't just a sort of a, a, a ritual that we engage in um, with, with no hope that anybody's hearing us. No, we have what we ask if we ask according to his will. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we can force God's hand, that we can manipulate him by our prayers. It doesn't mean that we can somehow predict precisely how God will answer all of our petitions. But we can know the kinds of prayers that God loves to answer. You, ought, uh, you and I ought to model our prayers on what God has revealed to us. Our, our prayers, especially as we mature in the faith, ought to begin to sound more like the Bible because that's what God has revealed to us. And God uh, delights to answer prayers according to his will. His word is his revealed will. That's why Martin Luther taught his um, uh, disciples to pray their own prayers by um, uh, making particular applications from the Lord's Prayer or from the Ten Commandments. He included also the Apostles' Creed. Not that the Apostles' Creed is Scripture, but it's a summary of God's revealed will in terms of who he is and what he's doing. So this is wonderful. We, we can know that God hears our prayers and we pray according to the will that he's revealed to us in Scripture. But then John gets more specific and he says, we ought to pray for the rescue of sinners, in fact, he's not even telling us that we ought to. He's saying we will pray for the rescue of sinners when we come to understand his will. Listen to verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. If we knew 
that our prayers for the lost actually do correlate with their salvation? Shouldn't we pray for them? Um, it, we, we should pray for them, and we should pray for the lost confidently. But then John offers a, a sort of hesitation. Listen carefully. He says, I do not say that one should pray for those who commit sins leading to death. Now, what is John saying? Is he, is he suggesting that there are certain people that we must not pray for or ought not pray for? Well, that's not exactly what he's saying, is it? John isn't technically saying, don't pray for them. Don't pray for those leading to death. He's simply not telling us to pray for them. Do you hear the difference? It's not... Um, it's, it's, it's the absence of a command, not a negative command. So I'm not telling you to pray for them. He's not saying, I'm telling you not to pray for them. So I hope you sense that difference. But, but he is saying this, that the sin of some people, he talks about the sin leading to death, the sin of some people, perhaps like false teachers, those that John was writing against in this letter, the sin of some people is is so egregious that they actually encourage us to pray for others instead of themselves, to maybe pray for others like the ignorant or the misled or the enslaved. And so um, this is what John is saying. We'll, we'll be naturally inclined to pray for those um, who are not committing a sin leading to death, those who are not... Um, uh, most deeply entrenched in opposing God. We'll, we'll be encouraged to pray for those others. Um, and we do so confidently, knowing that God hears our prayers, particularly for the lost. There's a third thing we can know brought out in this passage. We can know that we are protected from evil, verses 18 and 19. I wonder if you ever feel frightened by evil. Sure, surely you do. But I don't just mean the kind of evil that happens outside of us. Yeah, we're concerned or frightened by the evil of terrorists or kidnappers or scam artists or whatever it is in particular that, um, that makes you anxious. But, but I, I'm asking, are we frightened by the evil we know that we're capable of? Do you ever think about the, the, the kinds of sin that you're capable of? Maybe the things that you dream or that you catch yourself daydreaming and you, 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 you suspend that dream, but, but you're frightened and you're, you're left thinking, am I destined to, to live out that sin because I've thought about it, because I've dreamed about it? I'm scared just by what I'm thinking. Listen, John has written about a kind of sin that leads to death in the previous verses, but all sin leads to a kind of death. That's why sin frightens us. All sin diminishes joy and threatens our flourishing. That's why God's children are frightened by sin, the sin that they dream about or think about or imagine. We should fear sin. But here's the encouragement that we can know God protects from evil those who are born of him, verse 18 says. So, so bank on that promise. Of course, it doesn't mean that we take a lax approach to fighting sin. It's actually just the opposite. Um, but but we, we, we fight sin with confidence, knowing, as John says, that believers are not part of that world that lies under the power of the evil one. Right? We need to know this. We are not um, sort of playthings of the evil one that, that can be manipulated to do any kind of atrocious evil. Right? We, we, we've been born of God. And as John has, has said before, um, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him. The evil one does not touch him. The surest way to quit fighting against sin is to assume the fight is useless. Maybe you've found that out to be true. You say, well, there's no point. There's no use. I'm, I'm destined to fall into this sin. Well, then surely you will. But fighting against sin isn't useless for the Christian. 
God assures us that we will win that fight. And that is the best encouragement to keep on fighting. So keep fighting against sin, knowing that you are protected from the evil one by faith in Jesus Christ. There's a final thing that we can know, and with this John closes his uh, first epistle. We know God. We know God. Verses 20 and 21. And and that ought to raise an important question in our mind. How can we know God? Of course, as humans, we sense that there is a God. It's impossible to not sense that there is a God who has made everything that we experience. God has left just enough traces of his wisdom and power and holiness and justice and goodness and truth for us to seek him. So he's left a sort of a a, 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 a scent trail uh, that we as humans can follow. We can sniff and smell out that, that a God who has created everything has been here before and has made what we now see. Acts 17 verse 27 says that. But listen to, listen to John again, understanding that God isn't like us. We can't easily relate to him. We can't see him, right? So how do we know a God that we can't see? We can't follow that trail and all of a sudden r- r- arrive at him through our own pursuit. So how do we know God? Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. God sent his son, the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1 verse 15 says, God sent his son into our midst so that we might know him. He doesn't remain hidden. He reveals himself to his children. And God's gracious self-revelation clarifies the letter's ending that has sometimes caused people to puzzle. He says this, little children, keep yourselves from idols, verse 21. And we think, why would you introduce a new topic at the very end of the letter? In fact, the last word of the letter, idolatry. Well, he's not introducing a new topic. Um, what, What do we mean when we say idolatry? Well, we could go back again to Acts chapter 17, verse 30, where Paul says this, God is not an image formed by the art and imagination of man. What is idolatry? Idolatry is trust in a rival deity. Idolatry is our attempt to heal our brokenness and satisfy our longings apart from a relationship with God. And we do that all the time. And that's why John can write as a pastor, as a father to his flock, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Here's the reason that John would give this call to flee idolatry at the end of this letter. If we can know the true God, as John says we can, why would we want to settle for chintzy replacements? Children, keep yourselves from idols. Know God instead. I think most people going to uh, buy lottery tickets don't think they're actually going to win. They certainly don't know that they're going to win. They're simply taking a chance. They feel some tinge of hopefulness. God doesn't want us to take a chance on Christianity. He wants us to be certain, convicted of definite truths that truly change our lives. He wants us to stop guessing about life and start knowing what he has accomplished for us. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us your word that reveals you to us and confirms what we have sensed in nature. We pray that you would help us to know these truths and be certain of them, all of these truths that come out of eternal life through relationship with you, and give us faithfulness through confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing now number 577, a song of certainty and confidence. By grace, I am an heir of heaven, 477.
answer together again the two questions that we're trying to memorize as a congregation this month through the Heidelberg Catechism. They ask about the um, the supernatural birth of Jesus Christ and what that means for us who have been born into sin. So please answer with me. What does it mean that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? That the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a true human nature, so that he might also become David's true descendant, like his brothers in all things except for sin. How does the holy conception and birth of Christ benefit you? He is our mediator. And in God's sight, he covers with his innocence and perfect holiness my sin in which I was conceived. Amen. Let's sing now our closing hymn number 571, the glory of poetry. Glory be to the Father. Before our closing prayer, let me invite you again to our evening service, which you can view either on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us once again, and we pray that you would bless us now as we leave this this setting in which we have uh, heard who you are and and the certainty of what we have in you and go into uh, the, the remainder of this day. We pray that you would bless us and keep us and cause your face to shine upon us and be merciful to us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. God be with you all. Go in peace.